Hello and welcome to the Complete History of Science. Series 3, Episode 1, The Scientific Dark Ages. By 216 AD, Galen, the greatest doctor of antiquity, was dead. His death followed Ptolemy, the great astronomer, who had died some half-century earlier. Though no one could have known at the time, their passing marked the end of the first great flowering of scientific thought. The era which had begun in ancient Greece in around the 6th century BC had produced an explosion of scientific ideas across the Greek-speaking colonies of the Mediterranean, resulting in centuries of steady scientific progress. The work of both Galen in medicine and Ptolemy in astronomy and optics was arguably the culmination of this progress, because each of them had managed to synthesize centuries of disparate Greek scientific work into a coherent whole. However, the world in which Ptolemy and Galen lived had already changed dramatically. At this time, the Roman Empire was near its peak, stretching from Britannia in the north to Egypt in the south and Syria in the east. Rome had, for the last two centuries, dominated the Mediterranean militarily, and increasingly, Roman culture had spread throughout these conquered regions. Indeed, Galen, born in modern-day Turkey, and Ptolemy in Egypt, each bore a Roman name, indicating they were likely each full Roman citizens. But arguably, for these men, this identity was only superficial, because culturally and linguistically, these men were Greek, and inheritors of the Greek scientific legacy. But they were also arguably the last great scientists who could make this claim, and neither man would have an obvious successor in the Greek-speaking world. While their achievements were appreciated, there would be no one to take up their mantle, and scientific progress in the succeeding centuries, roughly between 200 and 800 AD, would all but cease. The question which arises then is why? Why did this happen? Why did science stop advancing? Why did no one build on the legacy of Ptolemy and Galen? And perhaps we already have an answer in mind. In the 14th century, the poet Petrarch, looking back on European history, had imagined a dark age separating his own day from the heights of Greece and Rome. In his view, this era was marked by a period of cultural regression, which coincided with the collapse of the Roman Empire. However, nowadays, the idea of a Dark Age is deeply unpopular with historians, who see the term as too absolute and too dismissive of a period which was still remarkably intellectually and socially lively. And on the whole, I think that this is true from the perspective of the history of science. Because although there was an undeniable decline in scientific output in this period, it would be a mistake to think that knowledge of science ever disappeared completely in the West. It's also true that in scientific terms, the period of decline we're talking about occurred much earlier than the fall of the Roman Empire. And so if there was a scientific dark age, it's not really commensurate with the dark ages which Petrarch placed in the popular imagination. We should then be careful in the types of questions we ask, and for our purposes, we may get further by asking a different but related question, which is, to what extent did science decline during this period? When we delve into it, what, if any, scientific work was taking place? What were people thinking about and doing during this time? And how did this link to the more dynamic scientific periods which took place before and after. Well, as we've mentioned, the period immediately following the deaths of Galen and Ptolemy was dominated by Rome. And on the whole, we must conclude that the Romans never embraced science or natural philosophy in the same way as the Greeks. While the Romans professed a deep respect for Greek language and culture, This was frequently only at a surface level, and they primarily regarded learning as a leisure time activity 
rather than something to be pursued full-time. The effect of this was that the Romans didn't read many of the most important Greek scientific works. This is evident in the fact that the books of many of the most important Greek authors, such as the astronomical work of Hipparchus and Eudoxus, were left untranslated. By contrast, the ultimate source of much Roman knowledge on astronomy came from the poet Aratus, whose poem on the constellations and weather was translated on four separate occasions. The Roman attitude to learning meant that much of their exposure to Greek ideas came not from the original work, but from books by encyclopedists and popularizers who summarized Greek thought. One of the earliest of these Latin writers was Varro, who wrote a work known as The Nine Disciplines. This organized Greek learning into nine topics, grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, musical theory, medicine, and architecture. This was influential because these classifications were used by later Roman writers, and eventually the first of these seven disciplines, known as the liberal arts, formed the curriculum of universities throughout the medieval period. Many Roman writers followed the template set by Varro for encyclopedic work, including Celsus, who wrote an influential medical encyclopedia, Seneca, who summarised much Greek natural philosophy, and Lucretius, who wrote an epic poem detailing the worldview of the atomists. However, Perhaps the writer who best exemplified the Roman attitude to science and learning was Pliny the Elder. Pliny's most well-known work is his Natural History, which is divided into 37 books on every imaginable topic, with subjects as diverse as anatomy and astronomy, through to anthropology, botany, mineralogy and art. In order to write it, it's said that he and his assistants perused 2,000 volumes by over 100 different authors, collecting around 20,000 facts. Pliny is of course now famous, however, for his lack of scrutiny of these so-called facts. He reports on exotic races, such as the Aramaspi, who supposedly only have a single eye in the centre of their head, and the Monocoli, who hop around on a single leg. Likewise, he records miraculous cures, such as using pig's lard for hemorrhoids, or tying fox's genitals to your head to cure a headache. Nevertheless, despite the lack of scepticism, Pliny does also include some more reliable facts, for example in astronomy. Pliny correctly described the planet's west-east rotation through the zodiac, as well as their retrogressions, and knew that Mercury and Venus remain within 22 and 46 degrees from the sun. He also included a detailed description of the phases of the moon, gave the correct cause of lunar and solar eclipses, and included Eratosthenes' value for the circumference of the earth, which was a figure widely circulated in works throughout antiquity. It is however clear that Pliny didn't widely read astronomical specialists like Hipparchus. Indeed, His goal was clearly not to create a comprehensive or definitive account of natural philosophy as it stood, but was instead to write an entertaining and interesting compendium of information for the casual Roman reader. The popularity of Pliny's work exemplifies the Roman attitude to learning as a pastime. The last of the great encyclopedists who deserve a mention is Martianus Capella, who was writing in Roman North Africa between 410 and 420 AD. Capella picked up on Varro's organisation of knowledge into distinct disciplines and wrote his own encyclopaedic work on the marriage of philology and mercury, also known as on the seven disciplines. He divided learning into seven categories, grammar, dialectic, rhetoric, geometry, arithmetic, musical harmony and astronomy, which he characterised as seven bridesmaids. Most of this work is a summary of previous authors, but interestingly, the section of astronomy contains a rather strange account of the astronomical model. <laughs>
In his telling, the Earth is at rest at the centre, orbited by the Sun, Moon and stars. However, Capella deviates in his description of the planets. He says that while the superior planets orbit the Earth, the inferior planets, Mercury and Venus, orbit the Sun. It's difficult to know what to make of this passage in the context of the astronomical knowledge of late antiquity. Ptolemy had known it was necessary to treat the orbits of Mercury and Venus differently from those of the superior planets, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. However, he had taken care to ensure that he could make all of the planets fit into his geometric model. Capella, it seems, had never read the Almagest, and instead presents his model with little justification, as if it were simply accepted scientific fact at the time of writing. Unfortunately, we don't know why Capella chose to do this, because there seems to be little justification in any other scientific literature from the time. Capella's account, then, is something of a curio, but nevertheless demonstrates that alternatives to naive geocentrism must have existed during the Roman period. The Roman Empire, however, would not last forever. Capella himself was writing after the sack of Rome by the Visigoths in 410 AD. This marked the nadir of the fortunes of the Roman Empire, which had been on a general downward trend for some time. During the crises of the 3rd century AD, barbarian invasions, plagues and civil wars led to a severe weakening of the political institutions of Rome. In the 50 or so years between 235 and 284 AD, some 26 different individuals claimed the title of Roman Emperor. And while this period of instability would not mark the end of the Roman Empire, it would change it dramatically. Firstly, the Emperor Diocletian would split the enormous and unmanageable empire into four parts, ruled by different emperors. Then, one of his successors, Constantine, declared that a huge new capital would be built in the Greek-speaking East, in a city which would become known as Constantinople, through which the Roman Empire would live on. However, arguably the most transformative event in the intellectual life of the Mediterranean wasn't due to any declaration of a Roman Emperor, but was instead a movement originating with ordinary people. Christianity had been bubbling below the surface of the Roman Empire for centuries, and had been the subject of persecution under Roman emperors, most famously Nero. However, by the time of Constantine the Great, three centuries later, Christianity had grown widespread enough that it could no longer be ignored, and so Constantine was forced to formally end the persecution of the Christians. Before long, Christianity would become the majority religion of the Roman Empire. The rise of Christianity would greatly influence the development of science in the West, and will be part of the background of our narrative for centuries to come. Of course, this relationship between them would often be tumultuous, but nevertheless, science and Christianity would ultimately shape one another into the forms we know today. From the outset, Christian thinkers were greatly influenced by Greek philosophy, which was still widely read and studied. At this time, the most important school of philosophers were the Neoplatonists, whose work was influenced by Plato, but also Aristotle. Much of their work, in fact, aimed to combine the work of the two great philosophers into a consistent whole. This was a difficult endeavour, however, because as we have seen, many of their ideas were clearly contradictory. For example, as we've discussed previously, whereas Plato thought knowledge should be derived solely from pure reason, Aristotle elevated knowledge gained from experience. The desire to unify was a consequence of the deep reverence for the works of both philosophers which existed at the time. Many of the Neoplatonists were reluctant to accept that Plato or Aristotle could be wrong, and so sought to work through the incongruities. This took the form of commentaries on Plato and Aristotle, which both attempted to explain and expand upon the work of these earlier philosophers.
and many of them became important books in their own right. Arguably, in fact, these commentaries formed a rich body of work, which represented the dominant expression of intellectual endeavour taking place around the Mediterranean during this period. However, we should note that these commentaries were largely interested in the more ethereal aspects of Plato and Aristotle's work, rather than in natural philosophy. This is evident in the lack of commentary in certain areas. For example, Aristotle's biological work, which formed a huge proportion of his output, was entirely ignored. The Neoplatonists were instead attracted to more metaphysical questions, such as the nature of good and evil, or the nature of the soul, and hence left scientific questions unasked. Science during this period, then, declined at least in part because these types of knowledge weren't valued in the intellectual world of late antiquity. Early Christian thinkers, however, were deeply embedded in this world. Many of them had an extensive education in Greek philosophy, and some were highly involved in the Neoplatonist schools before their conversion. It is perhaps unsurprising, then, that many of them were keen to place their own beliefs on the more solid intellectual footing provided by Neoplatonist thought. However, their newfound religion also meant they were unwilling to compromise their beliefs if their Christian faith should come into conflict with the supposed truths of Greek philosophy. The Christian Church adopted a position which was best put by St. Augustine, who called philosophy the handmaiden of religion. What he meant by this was that Christian theologians should put philosophy to use to deepen their understanding of scripture, but should always reject aspects of philosophy which may undermine their faith. This approach allowed Christian commentators to be more sceptical of Greek philosophical work than the pagan Neoplatonists, and in some instances they were actively encouraged by the church to criticise philosophical ideas which contradicted the Bible. The most important of these critics was John of Alexandria, now commonly known as John Philoponus, who lived between 490 and 570 AD. John's work is of particular interest to us, because unlike most writers of the time, John wasn't purely interested in metaphysics. Rather, John's importance is that he wrote extensive arguments against aspects of Aristotle's natural philosophy. Up to this point, Aristotle's natural philosophy had largely been unopposed, accepted by virtually everyone since his death. John's critique, then, is of great importance, if for no other reason than it was the first time since Aristotle's death in 323 BC that his work had been seriously challenged. As a Christian, the bulk of John's criticism took aim at aspects of Aristotle's work which contradicted biblical teaching. For example, Aristotle subscribed to the belief that the universe had no beginning, or in other words, was of infinite temporal extent. John, on the other hand, believed in biblical creation, and so set out to demonstrate that an infinitely old universe was absurd. He postulated that a universe which stretched back in time forever would take an infinite amount of time to reach its present point. But how could that be? How could an infinite amount of time elapse? This argument, of course, lies within the realm of philosophy rather than science, but it demonstrates how John contested Aristotle's cosmological ideas. More importantly for us, John wrote an argument against Aristotle's theory of matter. You may remember that Aristotle had separated matter into the four elements, earth, water, wind, and fire, found on the earth. But there was also a fifth form of matter, a sort of ether, found in the celestial sphere above the earth. In his view, since these spheres were made from different forms of matter, they also had different laws of physics governing them. Aristotle thought that this was necessary to explain the very different types of motion which he observed in the two spheres. 
For example, the planets were observed to move indefinitely around the celestial sphere, whereas on Earth, objects seemingly came to rest after some time. John, however, was strongly opposed to the idea that matter found on Earth differed from that found in the rest of the solar system, and he based his arguments on a critique of Aristotle's theory of motion. Aristotle's theory of motion had differentiated between natural motion and unnatural motion. Natural motion was the supposed motion of the four elements, which was either upwards in the case of air and fire, or downwards in the case of water and earth. By contrast, unnatural motion was motion which we actively participate in, that is, motion which is caused by an external mover. The example John used of unnatural motion was throwing a javelin. Aristotle had believed that unnatural motion required a force and would only continue for as long as the force was in contact with the object. But this theory was clearly problematic, and even Aristotle had realised the obvious objections. If, for example, a force was necessary to keep an object in motion, why does a javelin keep moving after it leaves your hand? Aristotle's solution was that the air, still in contact with the javelin, keeps propelling it, even after you throw it. John was contemptuous of this idea, positing that if this was true, soldiers could use giant bellows to fire javelins. John's explanation instead was that when we move an object, we impress a force upon it, which keeps it in motion. So when we throw a javelin, the javelin gains some kind of internal force, which keeps it moving. He believed that this motive force contained in objects was expendable, explaining why a thrown javelin would eventually come to rest. John argued that this same motion must be true for the planets, which were made of the same substances found on Earth. He believed that the planets were set in motion by God, and they also may eventually come to rest. This reconciled the observation of the motion of the planets with his Christian belief that the universe was both created and if God wills it, perishable. Another important aspect of Aristotle's thought that John critiqued was his denial of the existence of a void. This was again connected to his theory of motion. Aristotle had reasoned that the velocity of an object travelling through a medium was inversely proportional to the density of the medium. So for example, a ball falling through treacle takes more time to fall than one falling through water, which in turn falls more slowly than one moving through air. Aristotle extended this line of reasoning to its natural conclusion, saying that the same ball falling through a vacuum or void would have to move infinitely quickly, an obvious impossibility according to him. John's theory differed from Aristotle by instead assuming that the weight of a body would be the ultimate determiner of an object's speed, rather than the medium. So, if an object were to fall in a vacuum, its speed is not determined by the medium, but by its weight. Or, put another way, a void is possible, because although there is no resistance, a heavier body will still fall quicker than a lighter body. Interestingly, this was one point on which Aristotle and John seemingly agreed. Aristotle famously believed that the weight of an object is proportional to its velocity. However, unlike Aristotle, John seems to have made the empirical observation that in practice, there's very little difference between the time it takes different weights to fall. This is seemingly a contradiction then, because on the one hand, John says that heavier weights should fall faster, but on the other, says that what we observe when we drop two different weights is that they fall together. John resolves this by saying that the effect of the medium was to close the gap between the heavier and lighter objects. So when two objects of different weights fall through the air, the effect of the air is to allow the lighter object to catch up with the heavier one. Now naturally, 
From a modern perspective, this theory lacks the rigorous technical or mathematical basis we've come to expect of a mechanical theory. Nevertheless, it's also clearly an improvement on Aristotle's theory, which is not only lacking in terms of theory, but fails to even make the correct observation of how objects fall. John's commentary on Aristotelian motion is arguably the most important scientific work between the 3rd and 9th century. While most of the Christian and Neoplatonist commentaries of this period are only interested in metaphysical or theological questions, John is one of the only writers to tackle questions of natural philosophy. John, a product of his age, isn't uninterested in these questions, but by grounding his arguments in empirical observations, he contributed immensely to future scientific endeavour. John's legacy then is assured. He was the only person, in a span of over a thousand years, to give an updated account of Aristotle's mechanics. His theory that a moving object has some expendable internal force marked a clear break with Aristotle. As we'll see, the idea that an impressed force is responsible for keeping objects moving would influence the development of even more advanced mechanical theories in the Middle Ages. Likewise, his observation that two objects of different weights land at the same time was a clear renunciation of Aristotle. And although we may balk at his explanation, it's still an important advance. Broadly, John's work is a clear counterpoint to the naive idea that Aristotle's views were always accepted as fact during this or subsequent periods. John's critique of Aristotle's would in fact emerge frequently in the following centuries, offering an alternative and much needed support to those lonely individuals who had also come to doubt some of what the great philosopher had to say. In the next episode, we'll be leaving late antiquity, pick up around 800 AD, and explore the foundations of what became known as the Islamic Golden Age. Thank you for listening to the show today, and I just have a couple of quick notes. Firstly, I'd like to thank everybody who got in touch and said nice things about the show. I'd also like to give a special thank you to listener Inclirian, who pointed out quite rightly that although I'd said that people should get in touch, I'd actually left no contact details in order for people to do so. That's now been remedied, and the email address will from now on be in the program description. The second point I'd like to make is that from now on, I'm going to change the release schedule of future episodes. Instead of holding on to episodes until I've got a complete series ready, I'm going to release episodes as and when they're ready. I'm sure most people will be happy with this change, but let me know what you think. And until next time, goodbye.